Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Neoplasia Part 2. Today we will discuss about the molecular basis of cancer briefly. Okay, so let's begin. Now to understand the molecular basis of cancer, I have divided today's video into three sections. In the first section, we will discuss about some fundamental principles briefly and we will talk about non-lethal mutation, monoclonality and four target of cancer. Then in the second section of today's video, we will discuss briefly about some essential alterations that are needed to transform a normal cell into a cancer cell or malignant cell. And in the last section of today's video, I will draw a simplified flowchart to show you a simplified overview about the molecular basis of cancer. Okay, so let's begin. So first we are starting with the fundamental principles and if you ask me, Dr. Robiul, what lies at the heart of carcinogenesis from a molecular point of view or if you ask me what is the most important thing that is responsible for development of a cancer, I have to say that non-lethal mutation lies at the heart of carcinogenesis. This is a very important line from your textbook. Mark that line well because this is very important. Non-lethal mutation lies at the heart of carcinogenesis. Now what do we mean by non-lethal mutation? To understand non-lethal mutation, first we have to know what is mutation. And to understand mutation, first we have to know what is gene and to explain that thing I have drawn a simple image as you can see this is a cell a cell has a cytoplasm and a nucleus now inside the cytoplasm there uh, should have been a lot of organelles but I did not draw those organelles because uh, we are talking about the nucleus now so in a cell we will have cytoplasm, nucleus, in the cytoplasm different organelles and in the nucleus we will have chromosome, right? And as you can see I have zoomed into one chromosome and I have drawn it here. Okay, so this is a zoomed in version of say for example this chromosome and inside every chromosome we have the helical structure named DNA. So you can see we have DNA here, we have DNA here. And inside these DNAs we have gene. So gene is a part of a DNA and gene is also known as the unit of heredity. Genes can be classically defined as unit of DNA that can encode a particular protein or RNA molecule. Now since nowadays we have discovered a lot of information regarding the way genes are expressed so much more complicated definition of gene are available but let's not go into those biochemistry definition because otherwise the video will become extremely long. So that is gene, unit of DNA that can encode a particular protein or RNA molecule. Now what is mutation? Mutation means permanent heritable change in the DNA base sequence of an organism. Permanent heritable change in the base sequence of DNA of an organism. Now if we alter the base sequence of DNA, will that alter the gene? Of course, the gene will get altered. So 
mutation we can say in other words it is also altering the gene and now that we have understood what is gene what is mutation now we can go back to the first point that was non-lethal mutation non-lethal mutation means in this type of mutation there is permanent heritable change in the DNA base sequence however the cell did not die now is that a good thing or a bad thing if we think from the point of view of a cancer well if the mutation was lethal the cell would have died and if the cell died there was absolutely no way cancer could have developed so in a sense if the cell had died that would have been a good thing from the point of view of cancer the cell died so there is no cancer now what will happen if there was non-lethal mutation but the result of mutation was neutral nothing will happen no tumor will be formed so when does non-lethal mutation result in carcinogenesis this is very important dear viewers non-lethal mutation will result in carcinogenesis when that mutation will alter the proto-oncogene or the tumor suppressor gene okay so we will discuss about those genes uh, after a while so just remember that non-lethal mutation when altering those proto-oncogene or tumor suppressor gene can result in cancer formation in the long run so now that we have discussed the first fundamental principle that we need to know to understand the molecular basis of cancer now we will move on to the next fundamental principle and that is monoclonality always remember that tumor or in fact most of the tumors are monoclonal a tumor is formed from clonal expansion of a single precursor cell that had encountered a non-lethal mutation now to understand monoclonality further First, I will give you the example of X chromosome inactivation that occurs in female. And to understand X chromosome inactivation, you can see that I have drawn another image here. So this is the mother. Notice that she has two X chromosomes and we have labeled those X chromosomes as XA. This is the father. Notice the father has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome and we have labeled the X chromosome as XB. Now this is the daughter. Notice that she has one X chromosome from the mother and one X chromosome from the father. Now what will happen to this daughter in the blastocyst stage of development? Recall that in the blastocyst stage, there is random inactivation of the X chromosome. So, in some cells of the blastocyst, the XA will be inactivated. And in other cells of the blastocyst, the XB will be inactivated. And always remember, this inactivation is irreversible. So, once inactivated, in all the daughter cells, that configuration will remain intact say for example we are talking about this particular cell okay and suppose in this cell during blastocyst stage of development the x chromosome that came from the father that means the xb got inactivated the x chromosome that came from the mother that is the xa that remained active and since this configuration is irreversible so in all the daughter cells that has derived from this cell that configuration will be intact so in all these daughter cells you can see that the B is inactivated in all of them and A is kept active and we can use this thing 
to diagnose clonality of a tumor. Now, let us suppose that this particular cell encountered a non-lethal mutation and now it is producing tumor. So all the cells that have derived from this particular cell will carry that non-lethal mutation and at the same time they will carry that same configuration of X chromosome inactivation. And in case of female, we can use this to assess monoclonality. That is, we can use polymorphic X-linked marker to assess monoclonality in female. These markers include glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. There is also another enzyme known as iduronate 2 sulfatase, another enzyme known as phosphoglycerate kinase. All these can be used as polymorphic X-linked marker to detect monoclonality in female. Similarly, in some cancers where there is translocation, say for example in chronic myeloid leukemia, that translocation can be used to assess monoclonality. Similarly, in some other tumors, say for example B-cell lymphoma and T-cell lymphoma, we can use immunoglobulin receptor and T-cell receptor rearrangement to detect monoclonality of B-cell lymphoma and T-cell lymphoma respectively. Okay, so that is briefly about monoclonality. So now we will move on to the last fundamental principle that we need to understand the molecular basis of cancer and that is a discussion about targets of cancer. So, there are four classes of regulatory genes that are the principal target of genetic damage. When these genes are mutated, there is chance of development of cancer in the long run. So, what are these genes? As you can see, these genes are proto-oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, genes that regulate apoptosis, and genes that regulate DNA repair. So let's talk about these genes briefly. So what is proto-oncogene? Proto-oncogene is a normal gene that is found inside our cells. Its function is to encode proteins that regulate cell proliferation and cell differentiation. It also has some role in signal transduction and it also has some mitogenic effect that is it can um, trigger mitosis and cell cycle. So we can see that we need proto-oncogene for the normal growth and differentiation of our cells. When the proto-oncogene gets mutated we call that oncogene. Okay and one interesting thing I would like to add in fact, oncogene was discovered first and then the scientists realized that what they have discovered is actually a mutated form of a normal gene that's function was to help cellular growth and differentiation. But when that proto-oncogene gets mutated, it becomes oncogene and oncogene can result in cancer development in the long run. So, examples of proto-oncogene include MYC gene, WNT gene, etc. On the other hand, tumor suppressor gene are the opposite of oncogene. Tumor suppressor gene inhibit cell proliferation and they also inhibit tumor development. Okay, so that is tumor suppressor gene. And one thing that I would also like to add here, when there is mutation in the proto-oncogene, um, the mutation is of dominant type. And by dominant, I mean if one of the allele of the proto-oncogene is normal and the other allele got mutated, the cell will transform despite of the presence of the normal allele. Okay, so that is about proto-oncogene and 
In case of the tumor suppressor gene, both allele must be mutated, okay, uh, for the tumor suppressor gene to have diminished function, okay. So there is an important difference between proto-oncogene and uh, tumor suppressor gene. Now the best analogy to understand proto-oncogene, oncogene and tumor suppressor gene is to use the analogy of a speeding car. So suppose you are in the highway, it's a holiday so the roads are empty so you want to speed up. So what do you do? You just floor the gas pedal so now your car is increasing in speed and that is like the function of proto-oncogene when our cell decide to grow rapidly it will use those proto-oncogene to proliferate now after it after a certain time you realize that you have gained a high speed in your vehicle so now you want to slow down so what do you do you just remove your foot from the gas pedal right and then the car normally slows down but what will happen if even after removal of your foot from the gas pedal the car doesn't slow down that is what will happen if your gas pedal is stuck okay so that is the uh, function of oncogene so always remember oncogene is like a stuck gas pedal so how will you slow your car now your gas pedal is now stuck so the only way you can slow your car is by using the brakes now what will happen if your brakes are now also defective and the brakes are like the tumor suppressor gene okay so think of that analogy and when your accelerator is stuck and your brakes are defective and you are driving very fast the end result or the outcome is not good either you will crash or you will uh, have a serious injury and similarly here when we have mutation in the proto-oncogene which has now become an oncogene and when we have mutation in the tumor suppressor gene that can result in formation of cancer in the long run. The other two regulatory genes that are also target of genetic damage are genes regulating apoptosis and genes regulating DNA repair. Now I have a separate video about apoptosis but uh, to say in short apoptosis is a pathway of programmed cell death where the cells are committing suicide and apoptosis is a better alternate a better alternative when the cells are so much damaged that their DNA cannot be repaired because if we um, keep those cells with those severely damaged DNA alive then there is risk of mutation in those DNA and that can result in development of cancer in the long run okay so uh, in the cells that have either been injured by radiation cytotoxic drug or some viral infection or due to some other cause and the DNA has been damaged beyond repair in those cases killing those cells or uh, apoptosis may be considered a better alternative so when the genes regulating apoptosis are mutated apoptosis will not occur and then the, those cells will not die and there will be increased chance of development of cancer now genes that regulate DNA repair those genes are also another target for genetic damage and if there is damage to those genes that will also result in cancer formation indirectly let me explain now if we damage the genes which regulate DNA repair what will happen that will result in decrease in the DNA repair so now uh, proto-oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, when those genes are getting damaged, they won't get repaired. And as a result of lack of repair of the proto-oncogene and tumor suppressor gene, it will cause development of cancer in the long run. 
So now that we have discussed briefly the four target genes for genetic damage, now we will move on to the second section of today's video where we will briefly discuss the essential alterations that are needed for malignant transformation. So in your textbook you will see that there is seven essential alterations that are needed for a normal cell to become malignant cell or that is needed for malignant transformation. The first one is called cell sufficiency in growth signal and this is mainly done by the oncogene. Remember the analogy I said earlier? Oncogene is like a stuck gas pedal. What happens to your car when your gas pedal is stuck? Your car will accelerate even after you have removed your feet, removed your foot from the accelerator. Similarly, in order for a cancer to develop, there has to be cell sufficiency in the growth signal that is the cell must be able to grow even after the absence of the stimuli okay so that was the first point the second point is insensitivity to inhibitory growth signal that means tumor cells are insensitive to inhibitory growth signal or growth inhibitory signals um, that causes inhibition of cell proliferation in normal cells. Say for example transforming growth factor beta also known as TGF beta. This is an inhibitory um, signal. This inhibits growth of normal cell. However, this won't affect growth of tumor cell and that is when those cells will become um, cancer cells in the long run okay so that was the second essential uh, alteration for malignant transformation that is insensitive to growth inhibitory signal the third essential alteration is evasion of apoptosis or escape from apoptosis and we have already discussed about that the fourth essential alteration for malignant transformation is impaired DNA repair and we have also talked about that. The fifth point, the fifth essential alteration for malignant transformation is unlimited replicative capability. When a cell gets unlimited replicative capability that can become malignant cell in the long run and how does that happen that happens by maintenance of the length and function of telomere now what is the telomere you may be asking and this is a very interesting thing so I am writing here telomere now telomere is just repetitive sequence of nucleotide they are found at the ends of chromosome so if I draw a chromosome here inside the chromosome we have the DNA right so I'm drawing this helical DNA and at the ends of the chromatid these are the sites where we will have telomere. Now, what is the function of telomere normally? We'll always remember that when a cell is dividing, chromosomes are replicating and during every chromosomal replication, there is loss of chromosomal material and that loss usually occurs in the ends of the chromosome and since telomere is at that location so in fact with every chromosomal replication there is loss of nucleotide from the telomere but those are not important genetic material those are just repetitive nucleotide sequence so that is not hampering the genetic 
content okay but what is happening with every cell division the telomere is getting shrinked okay so there will be a time after say for example a lot of cycles of cell division that the telomere will become absent and that is the time when uh, if there is further cell division the genetic material will begin to get lost and ultimately there will be uh, truncation okay so in case of malignant tumor what do they do they use different mechanisms to maintain the telomere so if you can maintain the telomere even when we are uh, dividing the telomere is not shrinking what will happen that will make those cells immortal that is the reason why uh, in a lot of your textbooks you will see that cancer cells are immortal cells because they have figured out a way to maintain the function and length of the telomere okay so that was the fifth essential alteration that is needed to transform a normal cell into malignant cell that is unlimited replicative capability or in other words the ability to maintain the length and function of the telomere the sixth essential alteration for malignant transformation is sustained angiogenesis recall that angiogenesis means formation of new blood vessel and the thing is cancer cells or malignant cells they also need nutrients and in order to get nutrients they need blood supply okay and in order to get blood supply what do they do they induce angiogenesis by different factors one of the important factors that they use is known as vascular endothelial growth factor or v e g f okay and there are other factors that are released from the um, malignant cells to induce angiogenesis the last essential alteration for malignant transformation is the ability of the cell to invade and metastasis and i have uh, discussed about invasion and metastasis in my previous video so now that we have discussed about the essential alterations that are needed for malignant transformation now we will move on to the last section of today's video and now i will show you a flowchart uh, to to give you an overall idea about the molecular basis of cancer so you can see that I have drawn a flowchart uh, depicting a simplified scheme about the molecular basis of cancer. So let's go through the flowchart. So we will begin from here. You can see that this is a normal cell and the normal cell uh, was exposed to some DNA damaging agent. Say for example certain chemical, certain virus, and certain radiation. Now, what did they do? Those DNA damaging agents can damage the DNA of that normal cell. Now, sometimes the damage is not severe. In those cases, the DNA can be repaired. And in that case, the cell will return to normal. Okay, so DNA got damaged, but then DNA again uh, repaired, and now uh, it became normal again. But what will happen if the DNA is not repaired? Whenever there is failure of DNA repair, that will result in mutation of the genome. And one thing you can see that uh, the mutation or failure of the DNA repair can also uh, happen due to some inherited um, defect in the regulatory gene that used to uh, repair DNA or that used to do apoptosis. So we also see an inherited uh, mutation here that can also result in failure of the DNA repair. So what will happen? 
whenever there is failure of the DNA repair, there will be mutation of the genome. And as we have said previously, then there will be mutation in the proto-oncogene that will transform into oncogene. There will be mutation in the tumor suppressor gene and also mutation in the genes that are uh, used to regulate apoptosis. So whenever there is mutation in the tumor suppressor gene and mutation in the proto-oncogene and uh, as a result formation of oncogene, these two things will result in unregulated proliferation of the cell. Okay, so as you can see, unregulated proliferation of the cell. At the same time, since we cannot uh, kill those cells via apoptosis, so that will also result in unregulated proliferation of the cell. Then what will happen? There will be clonal expansion, as we have said before, that tumor is monoclonal. So there will be clonal expansion of the cell. And as we know, tumor needs blood vessels, so there will be angiogenesis. And also, the tumor cells will try to evade our immune system. So the tumor cells that are antigenic, they may die, and the tumor cells that are less antigenic, they will survive. Okay, and now comes the interesting part, and that is tumor progression. It is seen that with time, the aggressiveness of the tumor increases and so does the malignant potential. And uh, it is seen that this increase in their aggressiveness and in their malignant potential is not only due to increase in their number. The thing is, although we say that tumor is monoclonal, however, as the tumor is uh, progressing, uh, multiple mutation occurs in those neoplastic cells. Tumor progression most likely results from multiple mutation that will occur in the tumor cells independently and those multiple additional mutations will create subclones of tumor cell with varying ability to grow, to invade, to metastasis, and to evade uh, therapy. And also remember, during tumor progression, there will be immune as well as non-immune selection of those subclones. Say, for example, the subclone of the tumor that are highly antigenic, they will get destroyed the subclone of the tumor that are less antigenic, they will be positively selected. Similarly, the subclones of tumor that require less growth factor, they will be positively selected. Okay, so this is in short the um, explanation of the molecular basis of cancer. Now, molecular basis of cancer is a very big topic and uh, I tried to make a brief video about this so that you don't you do not get overwhelmed with so much information but i will recommend that you go to your textbooks and look into these uh, mechanisms uh, much more deeply to know much more information okay so that's all for today i hope this video was helpful see you again hopefully next week with a new topic of pathology so until then, take care and goodbye. Thank you.